I want to welcome you this morning. It's, it's great to have everyone here uh, today. And I tell you, if you're, <laughs> I feel like if you don't have an adrenaline rush after worship this morning, that's your own fault, right? Because it was something else. Uh, but this morning, we're going to hop right into things. If you have your Bibles with you uh, on your phone, tablet, if you have like a book version of the Bible, I encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, and that's where we're going to be camping out a little bit this morning. And I, I want to tell you just up front, uh, while I was preparing for this message, uh, which we are going to be talking about character and how character is important, how our reputation matters, I just, I don't know how to put it, I, I had to stop every once in a while because of just how deep this convicted my heart, how deep this convicted my soul, because... Uh, I've got to admit, there have been moments in my life in which I have displayed good character, especially when it comes to, you know, the life of the church. But then there are times that I have displayed some really, really poor, poor character. And I can't emphasize that word poor enough. My character, my integrity has not been the best at certain moments in my life. And I just want to put this in there. This morning we had a team meet about 9 o'clock. Scott's wanted to get this, this group of people together to pray that God works in an incredible way throughout the service. And uh, during that, Amanda Zimmerman, right? Or Smith, Amanda Smith, she uh, puts, her, puts her hand on my shoulder and starts praying for me. And um, I don't know if you realize how much that meant to me this morning. But there was something that said, yeah, you've struggled with your character, but that's, that's not necessarily what qualifies you to speak on the subject. What qualifies you to speak on the subject is that you're a human being still, still trying to figure it out. And that's what we all are here at Catalyst, right? A group of people, a group of individuals trying to figure it out, not by ourselves, but together. I believe that's a true blessing. So this morning, we are going to be talking about character and how character matters. And I'm excited uh, that we're going through this devoted series, which we started at the beginning of February, because I have not gone through the book of the Bible or, or been a part of preaching through the book, a book of the Bible in quite some time. In fact, in my previous ministry, I think we did go through a book of the Bible, but it was the letter of Philemon. And if you know scripture, that's like a one chapter book. So I guess I did get to go through a book of the Bible, but it was a one-week sermon series. But I just love the book of Acts because of the practical implications that it has for the church, and especially what we are trying to do here with the goals and mission that God has put forth for us here at Catalyst Church. Uh, just to kind of remind you, if you look at the heading of this book in your Bible, it may say something along the lines of Acts of the Apostles. And while that is extremely accurate, it could be more accurately called Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because if it wasn't for the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in the apostles and in the individuals of the church, I'm not sure that the rest of the book of Acts and the faithfulness that you see in this book would quite be there. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump right into things. Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1 this morning. Here's what we read. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So immediately in Acts chapter 6, we start off with a problem. A certain group of individuals are being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. And I just want to give us a little context, explain why this is such a big issue Whenever you see the, the word Hellenism in Scripture, you should automatically start thinking Greek. Start thinking Greek, a Greek culture, a Greek worldview. So these are Hellenistic, these are Greek Jews. And they aren't uh, Greeks who became, like they're now following Christ. They're not Greeks who were once not following Jesus and then started following Jesus. These are Greeks who actually became Jewish and then they began to follow Jesus. But here's the problem. The Hellenistic Jews, they feel like they're being overlooked in the distribution of food, especially their widows. Uh, this complaint is pretty justified. It's kind of like them saying, hey, look, we are Greek Jews. We're not Hebraic Jews. 
And our widows are going overlooked, and because of that, we feel like you are picking on us. And the complaint is justified. Just an example, uh, growing up, I'm about two years old, and my brother, Lucas, he comes along. Now, what if throughout all of our childhood, our family gets together, sits at the dinner table, or we go into a restaurant, and every time there's extra food or extra dessert, my mom and dad, they always offer it to me. Richie, we got extra, extra pork chops. Would you, would you like to have an extra pork chop? And I, of course, I say, yes, please, absolutely. What kind, of, what kind of question is that? Of course I want extra. Well, it's like, Richie, do you want to breathe? Of course I want, I want pork chops. Or, hey, South, collard greens. My brother doesn't like collard greens, so he'd be all for that. But what if they said, Richie, we got an extra cupcake or we got an extra cake for you. And every time that happens, my brother's sitting there like, okay, what in the world is going on? Eventually, over time, my brother gets sick and tired of it, and he looks at my mom and dad and says, hey, look, Richie, he may be your firstborn. I get that, but I'm, I'm like, I'm your son too. And I kind of deserve to be treated like that. See, these Hellenistic Jews, they may not have been the quote-unquote firstborn Hebraic Jews, but they were part of the body now. And that should matter, and they should be better taken care of. And that's where we continue in verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together, and they said, It would not, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. You know, I've heard this in the past, and I've just kind of put it to the side because I've got this thought in my mind of, how arrogant does that sound, right? It sounds a little bit arrogant, okay? But it, that's not exactly what's going on here. We have to pay attention to the context, pay attention to what these men are doing. And we say this often here at Catalyst, they understood that church was a team sport, right? They understood that it's all about calling. It's all about purpose. And if they would have been brought this complaint... And said, oh, okay, we'll look out for it. Uh, they would have potentially neglected their role, right? Which we're going to see here in a little bit. Thus, potentially neglecting the widows that needed to be served. And then they could have also neglected the church as a whole. So they understood it's better to do a few things and put, put all your effort towards that. And be really excellent at that. Instead of trying to do it all and be somewhat mediocre. And... They say, okay, it wouldn't be fair for us to focus on this and neglect that. So what do they do? Well, we see here in verse 3, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Note their purpose. Note, note where they're going to put their attention. Prayer Ministry of the Word. So this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is really interesting that out of all of these names that are mentioned, Stephen is kind of put aside as, as one with these really, really fantastic characteristics. Very, very specific in the description. And throughout the book of Acts, we're going to see why that is so. Uh, Stephen is a, a man who... I displayed very, very good character, who I want to be like, but I don't want to face the end that he does that we're going to be seeing. We read also Philip, Prochorus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nic uh, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism, woke up 7 o'clock this morning to practice all of these words, <laughs> and I still think that I, that I messed up, but it's all good. Okay, so we read here that they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And I think that's something that's interesting. A large number of priests are becoming obedient to the faith. I want you to note what happens here, that the increase happened when people understood their purpose, when people understood 
their calling. And with that being said, what I want to do over the next few moments is to look at three lessons, three lessons that we can, that we can see, that we can learn from, from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And here's lesson number one. It's that problems are a part of growth. It's not a matter of if you're going to have problems. It's just a matter of when they're going to come. Uh, at the beginning of December, um, I said, you know, Scott, you've been, you've been on my back about working out, about learning how to exercise, getting a little bit healthier, this, that, and the other. I think I'm going to take you up on it. I think I'm going to take you up on it. And Scott goes, all right. Hey, Scott's right here. Um, Scott's like, all right, meet me at Gold's Gym. Uh, in the morning, and we will get things started. So for like, I think it was like three weeks or so, I'm meeting him three times a week in the morning, and he's teaching me some uh, lifts, some exercises, some things to do uh, to work out and build a little bit, little bit of muscle and get a little bit healthier. And I remember while he was teaching me that, uh, there was this one exercise. It's, well, I hate this exercise. It's so terrible. But it's on this thing called an assisted pull-up machine. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Y'all know what assisted pull-ups are? They're exactly what they sound like. You get, let me demonstrate. So you get up, you have this machine, you climb a couple steps, and then there's this bar that you step onto. You step onto the bar and you hold these bars up here to do your pull-ups, but while you have that, you can distribute the weight so that it takes some weight off of you. Right now, I'm about... I'm about 120 pounds, let's say that. So about right now, and I put the thing at 20 pounds, and that takes 20 pounds off, off of my weight. So I'm actually, I'm maybe 120 pounds times two, but like when I, when I lift up, it takes that weight off of me. So I remember my first time doing it, three sets of 12. Scott's right there staring at me. I get my first set done, and I'm like, all right, great. I think I can do this. Well, then I get my second set started. And I remember specifically that I got to number eight. And then after number eight, I step off, and I'm like, I'm done. And Scott's like, why, why didn't you do nine? And I said, well, Scott, here's the thing. I'm real muscular. I don't want other people to feel bad. <laughs> I want to show you up. And he's like, stop with that. That's not funny at all. And he goes, well, how do you know you couldn't have got that ninth one in? And I'm like, I just know, man. I know my body. And he's like, well, you didn't even, you didn't even try to do that ninth pull-up. And I'm like, he goes, how do you know that you would have failed if you didn't even try? See, by not even trying or giving effort, I already failed before I had an opportunity to fail. See, I didn't see the problem as something that I could try and fail at, I saw it as, don't try at all. I didn't admit the problem and then pursue any type of solution. You see, large parts of the Old Testament were written in response to problems, failures that were going on in the church body. In fact, much of the Apostle Paul's writings were done to correct said problems happening both within the church amongst believers and then within the church by outside influences. I'll give you an example. Paul, he writes this letter called Galatians. And in this letter, he writes concerning two uh, walks of life, and he contrasts them a little bit. One walk by the Spirit and another walk of life uh, by the flesh. And we know, hopefully, the life by the Spirit. We know this as the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But before he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul, he talks about the life of the flesh and what that looks like. Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5, 19. He says, now the works of the flesh, they are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of, fits of rage, rivalries, Dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like them. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
So I look at this list and I can immediately pinpoint like in my mind the ones that are obvious that are really bad that you should not be doing. Sexual immorality, <laughs> don't do that. Drunkenness, okay. Orgies, yeah, don't get close to that. Uh, sorcery, witchcraft, all that stuff. That's obvious. That is very glaring. But what about impurity? You know, when I think of impurity, I automatically think of sexual impurity. But that's not exactly what Paul is saying here. He's talking more about impurity in a moral sense. He's talking about anything that compromises the morals expected of me as a follower of Jesus. This could be impure motives. This could be selfishness. This could be a lack of generosity like we looked at last week. What about another one? Dissensions. Dissensions. The Greek word that is used here for dissensions is dikastasia. I know I got that one right. <laughs> dikastasia. And this means uh, like a standing apart of or divisions that incite a rebellion. And then you can take that a step further with another word that is used here to describe dissensions and enmity. And that's like a really, really, really strong word that is used here. It's saying, not only do I disagree with you, but I also oppose everything about who you are and that you exist. Well, here's another one. Rivalries. Who loves a good rivalry? Yeah, I want to see some hands. We love a good rivalry. Growing up in Southwest Virginia, I'm a big Virginia Tech fan. And uh, the big rivalry is us and UVA. I'm looking at the Willis's over here. Virginia Tech and UVA. We don't like each other. It could be basketball, football, baseball, uh, soccer. It could be like club checker matches between the two schools. And we want to decimate each other. We want to destroy each other. But I will say this. When I moved down here to North Carolina and I'm asked about that rivalry, I kind of describe it as like a gentleman's rivalry where it's like we don't like each other, but there may be some instances where we do pull for the other team because the team they're playing, we hate more, right? Um, but that's a gentleman's rivalry. That is nothing like the rivalry that I see between the blue schools. And you know, you know who I'm talking about, the University of North Carolina and uh, Duke. I think it's interesting. Duke is a religious school, and they're the Blue Devils, but that's a different... It's a different conversation, but I tell you what, that, that rivalry is actually getting really good in football, but it's always been like the mecca of rivalries when it comes to what sport? When it comes to the basketball, and I'm not a fan of either school, but when Duke and UNC is playing, I'm going to watch it because I am intrigued about what's going to happen on the court, what's going to happen in the sidelines at the end of the game. I like to watch the handshake lines to see how the players react with one another. And the thing is, we love a good rivalry because somewhere deep inside of us, we want to be a winner, right? We want to be on top. We want to be right. We want to, we want to dominate. And here's the thing. Problems in the church originate when we focus on the flesh and how good we can do and not what God has already done. And relying on his Holy Spirit to indwell in us and work through us. See, in order to have success, we're going to encounter problems in order to get there. And if we rest on those problems, we become infatuated with them. They have the potential to become bigger and bigger. If we don't hit these little problems that are heels head on, they can end up turning into mountains. And mountains are really, really difficult to deconstruct. We have to move forward by living a life by the Spirit so our problems can be resolved in a healthy way. And that leads us to the next lesson that we see. And this is the role of spiritual leadership. I want to remind you of what Luke says here in Acts 6. He says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word 
in order, uh, the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Remember that these individuals, these men, they knew that church is this team sport. They understood, knew their purpose and calling. See, we can get so caught up in the, it would not be good for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. We can get so caught up in that that we lose sight on what these spiritual leaders did to resolve this issue. They used discernment. They used wisdom to encourage and and to an extent empower fellow believers to choose men from among them to serve in this area of ministry. In the past, I've read this, and I'm like, man, that's kind of that sounds kind of cold to these to these widows who are going overlooked. But that's not what is happening at all. Do you really think that these leaders, the apostles, didn't care about these widows? Absolutely not. They they love these widows, and that's why the apostles equipped others, gave room for others to do ministry in this area. And I've made this mistake before. I've been brought to the spiritual leader in the church. I have been brought a ministry issue. And I said, you know what? I'll, I'll do that. I'll make sure that's taken care of, been directly involved. And then I have, I have failed at trying to fix that, or I have neglected another area of ministry. I remember several years ago, this lady in the church, we'll call her Alice. We'll call her Alice. And she came up to me and said, well, Richie, I have, I have a friend who uh, is interested and Jesus interested in the church, and I was wondering if you could come and share the gospel with her. And I said, well, Miss Alice, I, I would love you. I would love to, but have you shared the gospel with her first? And Alice looked at me and goes, well, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't, I don't feel like I'm qualified or equipped to be able to do that. And you know what I said? I said, all right, give me your number, and I'll talk to her. Is that good spiritual leadership? I mean, it sounds nice, but the reality is I kind of failed in that. That was really poor leadership. Because the apostles, they, what they did is they equipped others to choose men to help in this area. What I should have done is responded to Alice by saying, Okay, what can we do? How can I help equip you to better share the gospel message with your friend? Because if you try to do it all, what ends up happening is You end up not only doing the part of others, but you risk trying to do God's part as well. I think one of the most humbling realities that we can come to terms with is that you and I, we're not the ones who save people. You're not going to save a single soul. Now, God, he invites you to be a part of that, but we don't save people. God's the one who does that, and he simply calls us to be obedient. So I was thinking about this. What, what exactly does this look like at Catalyst? Well, I warned her before. I'm going to use my little laser pointer. There you go. I warned her before of the message that I was going to embarrass her. But Sierra, Sierra Reeves, uh, she is doing a fantastic job uh, gathering together our ladies' ministry. And we have a lot of different ministries in the church but right now, I just had that ministry on my mind, on my heart. I believe that they had a lunch a few weeks ago at McAllister's, right? And I, I wasn't invited to that, which I'm still, <laughs> my feelings are still a little bit hurt uh, from that. But uh, they had a ladies' meeting. That I think they're planning a ladies' retreat that's going to be happening here in the fall. And uh, if you are a lady here at Catalyst and you're not connected with that ministry, oh my goodness, I encourage you to do so. Uh, But I was just thinking, what would it look like if Sierra came up to me and said, hey, you know what? I want you and Scott to do the ladies' ministry. I was hoping y'all would laugh a little bit at that. (laughs) And it's because I said Scott, right? No. (laughs) She's like, what if she did that? Well, Scott and I, we would politely say, you know what? I don't think that, that we are gifted in that area of ministry. Would that mean that we don't care about the ladies' ministry? Absolutely not. 
It just means that we have faith in someone else that they will do a great job and that they can put more energy and effort into it. And it also helps that Sierra is a lady here at Catalyst Church. It's important that spiritual leaders give others room to grow. I want you to think about it this way, and I hope that you have seen this. Uh, hopefully you see it above the water fountain out in the common area. But this is our discipleship wheel. And the disciples, when they uh, told the church, hey, pick seven men from among you, they were being spiritual parents on this wheel. They gave opportunity to others, seven men full of the spirit and wisdom, to go and actually do ministry. Here's the thing. If these spiritual leaders did not invest in others and release them to do things, and they said, oh, we'll take care of that. We'll make sure 100% that these widows are taken care of. What part of the wheel do you think they would have been on? They would have actually been doing the role of what we would see as a child, because they think that they can do it all, think that they are responsible for everything uh, that goes on and needs to try to fix everything. And this leads us to our last lesson, is that why is uh, it important, what is important in someone chosen to serve? Why these men? What is important in someone who is serving in the kingdom? And it's not what you might think. Apostle Paul, he says this in 1 Corinthians 1, 26. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I want you to think about who is writing this. It's this man named the Apostle Paul. And he knows what it means for God to choose the lowly. He knows what it means for God to choose the despised. We're going to be talking about this within uh, you know, our Acts study. But the Apostle Paul, he was, he was a bad man. A very, very bad man. Hated the church. He absolutely despised those who would follow Christ. And he's heading to Damascus to persecute the church. And there he is met on that road by the Lord, the risen Lord Jesus. Saul, Saul, his name before he became Paul. Why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting my church? Paul, Saul at the time, he becomes blind. And then a few days later, he is baptized. And he can see, I wrote in my notes, that Paul is the goat. Young ones, you know what goat is? Greatest of all time. He's the greatest missionary of all time. So Paul understood what it meant for God to choose the lowly and despise. See, there's so many who think that they have to have all their junk figured out in order to serve. And there are some, and I've experienced this and, and met people in the past like this, that, ha that think they have to have everything put together and figured out before they can even step foot in a church building. But I want you to think, what are we doing here at Catalyst? And Andy shared earlier that our mission is to introduce the world to who? The real Jesus, one person at a time. Real people with real problems serving the real Jesus. The real Jesus, not some made-up form of who Jesus is. One that expects you to be prim and proper every time you're around people within the church. See, God doesn't need you to be qualified. But he does need you to be obedient. See, God, he's not in the business of calling the qualified. He qualifies those who are called, which is every single person in this room. Because the thing is, if you feel like you have to become qualified... That you have to have things all figured out first. You know what you're doing? You're trying to do Jesus' job. What only he can do. He cleans you. But you simply have to be obedient. Because when you say yes to Jesus, 
your response is that of obedience. Jesus, he qualifies you to serve. And for followers of Jesus, if you've been following Jesus for a short time or a long time, there are a couple qualifications for those who are chosen to serve in certain areas in the church. The English Standard Version says, uh, a person of good repute and of all spirit and wisdom. Uh, I've heard people say something along the lines of, you know what, I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what people have to say, say about me. It's just me and Jesus, right? Well, if it is just you and Jesus, like you say, why are you posting all that junk on your social media? If it is just you and Jesus, like everyone says, or like you are saying, why are you being unfaithful to your spouse? If it really is just you and Jesus, why do you do this? Why do you do that? The reality is, your reputation should matter to you. Or at least, you should have an awareness of your reputation. For this very reason. It's that people should see Jesus living inside of you through the Holy Spirit. Your character matters, it counts. I want to read for you real quick the qualifications that we see of an elder here in 1 Timothy. We read, Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own family well and see that uh, his children obey him and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Verse 6, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment uh, as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So we see above reproach. That's a good reputation. Must have a good standing with the, within the body of Christ. And with uh, thought highly of by outsiders. See your reputation it does matter. But. There's always a but. If you are here this morning and you're thinking to yourself. He's saying reputation matters, and I lack a good reputation. Well, if that's you this morning, I got really, really, really good news for you. It's that you can start over. You can start fresh by pursuing Jesus. Don't forget that this is also a person who is full of the Spirit. And what exactly does that mean? Well, it's a person who displays the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That's how you can tell that someone is full of the Spirit. And as we wrap up, I, I just want to take a, a few moments to share with you four implications of what we have seen this morning and how Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7 can encourage us uh, to have the best character that we can. First implication is that problems become bigger when you try to solve them by the flesh. Remember, you're not the one who saves people. Jesus does that. He does the cleansing. If you try to fix all the problems by yourself without any involvement or leaving any room for the Holy Spirit to work, your situations are just going to become worse. So problems become bigger when you try to solve them by the flesh. And secondly, second implication is that prayer and ministry of the word are sufficient for the kingdom of God to move forward. It's not flashy. It's not like, oh my goodness. In order to do good things in the church. Prayer and ministry of the word. Duh. But I tell you. It's not flashy. But it's highly efficient. Next is our character matters. And it should reflect the fruit of the spirit. I remember when I was in elementary school. We did this campaign called Character Counts. Do y'all remember that? Y'all ever do the Character Counts campaign? It must have just been a thing we did in Southwest Virginia because we, we just had the best character. <laughs> but it was called Character Counts. And they took these different cartoon characters and 
They were encouraging students to have the best character possible. And I'm like, if we're being encouraged to do that in second grade at Kreitzer Elementary School, how much more should we pursue that when it comes to the calling God has put on our lives and the life of the church? But here is the last and final implication. It's that realizing our faults should inspire us to grow, not give up. You know, last week, a couple weeks ago, Scott gave this challenge to us by saying we don't want to be a minimum effort uh, group of believers, a minimum effort church. Y'all remember that? Nobody wants to give minimum effort, even though it's easy. Here at Catalyst, we want to be a maximum effort church. But you know what that means? It means that wherever you are at on that discipleship wheel, you need to ask yourself, what does it look like for me where I'm at in my walk with Jesus to be a maximum effort Christian? Because if we want to be a maximum effort church, it takes all of us as individuals uh, to look in the mirror and ask, what can I do to be a maximum effort Christian?